So this is 129S, and the student just before class created a Discord. And I put it at the top of the page here, so if you want to, you can join this Discord and chat about class contents. Um, I didn't create it, and I'm not probably going to be there, and I'm not moderating it or anything, but it is something created by a student, and it may be useful for people who want to chat about the projects or whatever. Yeah, it's Glow that did it. You put the link in the chat there, and I just put it at the top of the 129S page, so it's an option for people who want to chat about things. And today, we're up to bypassing client-side controls. So, um, Good. Okay, good. A lot of people seem enthusiastic about it, which is fine. I've got far too many social networks, so I'm not really looking for another, but uh, a lot of students like it, which is fine. Right. LinkedIn is the worst. LinkedIn is just an endless source of spam. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm. Sh it looks like a lot of people do want to have a class discussion, so I'm glad you did that. I appreciate the help. There are many good things that could be done, and I'm too busy to do them all, so I'm glad if... Students step up and do some of them. So, client controls are pretty simple. Um, however, the fundamental problem here is uh, developers typically send some kind of data to the client, like you set a cookie, and then when that client comes back to other pages on your site, you expect that cookie to come back up. And normally, in the simplest case, that's probably not bad because they do something like login and you give them an authentication cookie that is probably just a random number. And if they were to modify that cookie, you would just decide they had logged out. So that's pretty harmless. The problem is you might also set other kinds of data on their machine. And then when it comes back to you from their machine, you trust it because the developer might just not really understand where that data is coming from. They make a script, they find a parameter, they use it. They don't really think about whether that parameter came from the server or from the client. And so, they, um, it turns out, as we've talked about, the servers that are making your web page are not just one web server where you'll have administrative control over the whole server. There's a whole sprawling network of devices at your company, and it's already set up for some other purpose. And then you're trying to add some new feature, like a mobile app, and they say, just integrate it with the existing stuff without changing any of the existing stuff that's working. Just patch it in. So it often turns out that the easiest way to handle data is to just send data to the client and then believe it when it comes back. That way you don't have to get the administrator of some other service like the uh, authentication server on your network to recognize new ways of logging in or something. And this, I imagine, is why so many mobile apps store a copy of your password in the mobile app. So we can just do a login as if you'd typed it in. Instead of storing something sensible like a cookie on there, um, it just logs in with your password every time you log in, which means it's got an extra copy of your password, which they typically store in an unsafe way. Anyway, so that's you can see why this would happen, and especially the more I work at big corporations, the more I understand why it happens, because you're just one small department and you can't wait while you get approval and cooperation from other departments. So, uh, the problem is you can't trust anything that's done on the client, though. And so I made a page that demonstrates a lot of these things. So let's go here. Now, I, this is the Burp browser, the Chromium browser. And I thought I could zoom in. Guess I can't. All right. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Sort of weird I can't zoom in, but all right. Um, view. There is a zoom in. Oh, it's, huh, it's logo equals to zoom in. Well, that's weird. Let's see if that works. Logo equals. All right, there we are. So I made a series of things here which have fields on the browser. Now let me refresh this, get it back to its normal state. All right, and here's burp. And there's the browser I'm looking at. It looks like I can pretty much fit them both on the screen at the same time. So uh, this is the HTTP history. And so here you can buy a phone. So if you put in one, you buy one phone. And your goal is to buy a phone for 50 bucks. But if you buy one, you bought one for $449. So to buy a phone for 50 bucks, you'd have to find out how that price got there. And of course, the problem is the price came from the client. So if I go here and look at this request, send it to the repeater, and look at it here, you see, it sent quantity equals 1 and price equals 449. So the price came from the client. 
So all I have to do is change the price to 44. And now when I send that request, I get a response. And if I put render, I can see it here as if it was in a browser. And there you see, now I bought a phone for 44 bucks. So that's the simple case where I just modify a parameter that's going up to the server. All right, so if I go back to proxy history. So now here's another one where I'm going to get a discount. So I click here and that sends something to the server. And when I get a response, it set a cookie in my browser. And now when I buy one and submit, I got a discount of 10, but I want to get a larger discount. So again, I take a look at the post, which the last post that went there and send it to the repeater. Oh, I thought that one, this one there, the last post up here, send to repeater. Okay. And here it is and see, uh, no, that's not the right one. Let me clean out these old ones. Go to my proxy. Let's just clear out all the old stuff. Clear history. Nope, didn't listen to me. Oh, there we are. Yes. All right. Now I'm going to go back and try to get the one request I care about, which is buying one with a discount of 10. Okay. So that is the request that did that. So I send that to the repeater. And here you see quantity is one, price is 449. But I wanted to manipulate the discount. I guess the previous one was correct. Someplace up here is that there it is. The discount is in the cookie. Discount equals 10, which was previously set in my browser. And I could modify the cookie with a browser extension, but of course we can just do it in burp. So I can just make that discount 100 and send it. And you know, all these things client side are the same. There's something coming from the client which can be modified. And so now I'm going to get a phone with a discount of 100. All right. And let me go to my slides and see if there's anything else I should say before I just go on. So, yeah, that's how you modify it. And these pictures are from the older version of Burp. It looks a little different now. Anyway, um, by the way, sometimes you get replies. When I click send, does it touch the server? Yes, it does. When I click send, it sends it up to the server. And by the way, a well-designed app will not let you just repeat things in the repeater like this. It'll have an anti-CSRF token uh, where you would actually, um, it will not let you send an identical request again. So you'd have to use intercept. In fact, let me demonstrate that in case you haven't seen it or don't remember it. Um, there's another way to do this. And let's just go back to this one. If it wouldn't let me repeat this request, and the way it does that, it would have a hidden field with a random number, and it checks it. So you have to really have this page loaded and come from this page nowhere else. So what you do then is you go to Proxy, Intercept, and you turn on Intercept. Now you try to buy one, and it doesn't let the traffic go through. It waits here. So now you can change what it's about to send to like 43, and then turn off Intercept. And now it will let the traffic through and now you bought a phone for 43. That's often what you have to do. Only very sloppy applications will let you just send it to the repeater and repeat a whole request. That is uh, for apps that do not have an anti-CSRF token, which mine doesn't, and a lot of the ones in the Web Security Academy don't, but you'll reach the point where they do, and then you have to use intercept, which is a little more clumsy, but um, more likely to succeed. Anyway, so let me go back to my slides and see if there's anything else I should say here. Oh, yes. So sometimes if you get a response, it will be zipped and it will just be unreadable junk. So if that happens, delete the accept encoding in the request. This encoding is allowing it to zip the answer. So the server might zip it and then you won't be able to read it. So you'd have to turn that off. That's a, an issue. I haven't seen it that often lately, but uh, it is uh, something that happens when you're writing your own scripts in Python, I know. Anyway, uh, you can also program in the options. You can turn on a request header and you can 
do the, you can check this box and then it will automatically require non-compressed responses all the time. There's a bunch of useful things like that in Burp. Let me bring them up here. If you go into Proxy Options, there's a lot of good things down here, and here's the one I'm talking about. You can require non-compressed responses all the time here by checking that box, and then it will automatically always send a request header that will not accept compressed encodings, which is handy. All right. Um, and we talked about the cookie discount and how you can modify that the same way. And here's the URL parameters. So let's try this one. Uh, so we get to my burp. Here's my burp browser. So here's the URL parameter. I'm going to buy a phone. So I'm going to buy one phone and submit it. And notice I bought a phone for $449. And if you look at the URL, it's got the quantity equals one and the price equals $449 right there in the URL. Well, as we mentioned many times, putting things that matter up there is a bad idea. <laughs> Um, putting things that are secret up there is a bad idea. And putting things that matter up there means I don't even need burp. I can just change the price right there. Now the price is four. There, I bought a phone for four. Um, so you don't even need burp. You can, of course, do it with burp. If you go to uh, history, here's the last one. If I send this to the repeater, right click, send to repeater. Since I'm not using an anti-CSRF token, it'll let me send it. That's why whenever I send something to a repeater, usually my first move is just send it without modifying it at all to see if that works. Because if it has an anti-CSRF token, it will refuse this identical request. And you can look at the response. It's a 200 OK, which means it didn't reject it, most likely. And then you can look at it to see. And so I bought a phone, but I bought it for 449 so if I want to buy it for cheaper, I have to change the parameters, but the parameters are not down here. They're just up here. So I can change it to 41 and send that. And now I get a phone for 41. So, you know, you can do it in Burp, but in this case, you don't even need Burp. It's just sitting right there in front of you. All right. And there we go. All right. So you can have hidden parameters sometimes. Um, there, there are people that try to hide these parameters, like they put them in an image or in an iframe or in a form action up here, where there are parameters in the URL, but you try to prevent people from seeing it. And if you're using a phone or something, you typically can't see the address bar. And you can also hide the URL bars in other ways. So in principle, you can make it a little bit harder for the user to find this URL and modify it but you can't stop them from doing it in burp. So it's just another bit of data that you can't trust. Um, it's coming from the client and there are plenty of ways for the client to modify it. Now the referrer header is like the from address in an email. It doesn't really prove anything and that's what I'm going to show you here. So go back until I, there we are. So here is buy an iPhone, but you can only buy it from apple.com. So let's go to proxy, history, and clear all the old stuff. Clear history. Yes, all right. Now I submit to buy a phone, and it says fail. You are not allowed to buy one because you didn't come from Apple. So I send it to the repeater. And here I see referrer is from samsclass.info, so I just change this to apple.com and then send that and now it tells me congratulations you bought a phone from apple.com so this is the typical mistake of believing the referrer which is automatically filled in with the page you came from but could be modified and this is how the crime of swatting happens this is a big thing people do now. It's extremely dangerous, extremely illegal, but you can use websites to make phone calls and modify the caller ID field, which is just like that referrer page or the from in an email. It's not verified. So you can then call 911 and say, I've got a hostage, I've got a gun, I've got a bomb, I'm going to kill everybody. And the caller ID will be somebody else. And then the cops will send a SWAT team to that address and you can get somebody hurt. 
um, because the cops, even though they know that that they probably know that that field is not verified, most of the time the caller ID is correct. And this is a thing 911 calls do. Many people call 911 and they don't really explain things very clearly because they're like getting killed or something. So you just take the caller ID and you use that to find the address and you send the cops there, which is a reasonable thing to do. But um, yeah, there is no way to refer. I think the refer is indeed the refer. Well, is there any way to verify? No, there isn't. This is the fundamental problem with the stateless nature of HTTP. You send one request to a server, you get an answer, and nothing about the protocol remembers the past. Uh, this is like what I was talking last night in the exploit development class about C. The thing about C is it executes each individual command and it does not remember what came before. So if you make room for 10 characters in a variable and then you put in 100 characters, it doesn't remember that there's only supposed to be 10 in there. It just puts 100 in, even though they won't fit. And, you know, the, the HTTP request comes into a server with the referrer, but neither the client nor the server really have any way to know where you really came from. The same thing's true of email. The same thing's true of physical mail. If you put mail in an envelope, you can put the wrong return address on it. And there's no way for the post office to prevent that. Now, in principle, they could look at the mailbox you put it in and try to decide if you sent it for all well, they know you drove from another town to that mailbox you know fundamentally there's no way for them to verify that return address it's there is some attempt to verify the from address in emails now with some of the modern anti-spam techniques um, but as far as i know there's not much yet in verifying the uh, caller id and telephone calls after, yeah, the, that's right. The infrastructure of the web was just designed to make it work at all. You know, it was designed years ago just to deliver cat pictures. And then people started using it for important things like 911 calls it was never designed for. And, you know, on it goes. Well, yeah, it's, it's you know, it was all, this is the problem. You have something that was never designed for security. And then you start using it for really important things. And then you have to try to add security later. How does Referrer work again? Well, you, Referrer is automatically created by your browser. And it's just like everything else. You can modify it in Burp. So here's my request. And the Referrer is right there. And you can just change it to anything you want. Um, so that's how a hacker would access it with Burp. You could also just write a Python script that creates these requests. There's many ways. And uh, the cops uh, don't... Uh, remember, phone calls don't normally come in over voice over IP. You can do them over the internet, um, but in principle, for voice over IP traffic, you could try to verify the IP address. There's ways to spoof that too, for example, by using Tor or a VPN. But uh, it's an interesting idea. In principle, if you used a, um, an online service to make a fake phone call, which is what people usually do, then you would be able to notice that it's coming from an IP address of one of those known spam sites. And that might be a good way to prevent this, um, to refuse to accept 911 call, calls from those online services. There's another related problem, by the way. If you get um, an IP phone, there are various phones that connect to your internet. There's one called Magic Jack, and I think there's a lot of the others, and they warn you that these things will not send a proper caller ID. So if you were to make a 911 call on an IP phone, it typically will not tell the cops your address automatically. And you have to configure that somewhere in the settings. So it is a, it is a problem. Voice over IP kind of messes up the uh, caller ID system, which assumes you're just using the old normal telephones. Now let's assist cops in properly turning on body cams first. That's true. Anyway, um, so that's referrer. Let me check the slides and see if there's anything else to say about that. Um, yep, we did that. All right, now you might have data coming from the client that um, has a value here. And I see a question, is it legal to buy a burner phone? As far as I know, it's legal to buy a burner phone anywhere. You can just go to Target and buy one. I don't know how it could be illegal, but, but I guess I don't really know. Um, anyway. So you might just get a token that's just a long blob of data like this, and then you might believe that the even if somebody's using burp, they wouldn't know how to change a thing like that into meaning something else. 
because it's encrypted or at least obfuscated, scrambled in some way. So that's one way to make you believe that you can trust it. So if you want to hack something that has been obfuscated like that, you have to deduce the algorithm. Um, you might be able to find a function elsewhere. For example, it might obfuscate your username on some form that you controlled. So you can feed in a name and let it get obfuscated and try to notice the pattern. Um, and uh, you could just copy this and replay it. And then it will have the same meaning as before, unless it includes some kind of anti-CSRF token in that opaque data to make sure the same data will not be accepted a second time. You could also just try overlong values, different character sets, malformed strings, etc. But um, that opaque data, you're going to have to just sort of guess what it is and try a few tricks, and you might not be able to deduce what it is. For example, if it's really encrypted with something like AES and you don't have the key, you're not going to be able to forge that. Um, uh, ah, yes. I'm glad someone asked this question. Um, I forgot to mention this. I added in Canvas your Google Cloud instructions. I just got these stuff today. Google Cloud gave me credits. So, in fact, let me bring that up. I'm glad you reminded me. Uh, let me bring up the Canvas here and show it to you. Uh, so, CCSF. Canvas. This only works for the official CCSF students, not for anybody else. But in 129S and also in 127, I added an announcement here. And let me go to student view. So it'll show me more or less what you, and there you are, Google Cloud Education Credits. I just put this up there. So, Uh, yes. There we are. So you can go here and you can get a coupon which will give you $50 of free Google terms if you want to use a Google Cloud machine. Um, and uh, you only get one per email address. So even if you're taking both courses, you still only get one. It's good for next till next year. And uh, that's about it. Now, what other questions were they? It's only 50 bucks. So it used to be you got 300 free a couple of years ago, but Google quit doing that. Now all you get is 50 bucks free. Um, and uh, you can do anything with it. But So if you want a Linux machine, you're only going to cost you about a dollar a day. I'd say whatever cloud machine you make, be sure and turn it off when you're not using it to preserve your money. If you want a Windows machine, it'll cost you several dollars a day. So be sure and turn that off when you're not using it or you'll burn through your $50. But anyway, you do get some free Google service. And I see another question. Um, would Wireshark sniffing help in figuring out the obfuscation algorithm? No, I don't think so. Wireshark, in fact, is almost useless in the modern web because everything is using HTTPS. So if you sniff the raw packets with Wireshark, you just see unreadable encrypted stuff. Burp is better. Burp, man in the middle is it. Even though I'm using HTTPS right now, you can see the request. But if the request is obfuscated, then uh, you're going to have to guess it. And unless they used a fairly weak obfuscation or encryption scheme, you're not going to get in. But a lot of people do use weak encryption schemes or make mistakes which let you get in. Good. All right, so ASP.NET, for example, the Microsoft web service, um, it will automatically create a field called view state. And you can put stuff in view state with view state add on the server. So it will add information to this, and that will then be one blob of um, obfuscated data. Uh, yeah, replaying it, yeah, you just check what it does. For example, if you were able to uh, record a login, you might be able to replay that later and log in as the same user. Um, that's, so it's not that valuable, but you might get lucky. And there'll be some examples coming up. Yeah, that's why, you know, being able to replay it is a minor security flaw, but occasionally it will be useful. So now, now the user will have a view state value here in all their requests. Um, the form sent to the user will now have this view state value included with it. And uh, when you submit the form, it will send the view state up as data. And that's base64 encoded stuff. Now, in the old versions of ASP, it was just base64 encoded and readable. 
So you could just decode it and you would see the price right there. So the early, this is the same as micro, as basic authentication on the web. There's a time decades ago when people thought just Base64ing something was enough to hide it. But that's pretty lame. That you can undo. That's not a, So now in later versions of ASP.NET, you actually have Mac protection. So it adds a 20 byte keyed hash at the end. And therefore, it's not encrypted to hide it, but it is authenticated. So if you were to try to change the price, it would know that was not okay because the Mac would not match. You know, the Mac is a hash value with a secret key that you don't know. So you can't forge that. And that's what the more secure way to do this is. If you really want to send data to the user and then believe it when it comes back, you ought to use some kind of authenticated data with some kind of cryptographic signature so you can tell when it's been modified. And if done correctly, that can be very secure. And so here's a uh, view state. Because Mac is not enabled, this view state um, in Burp Street Professional was able to take it apart and see there's a price in there, and you could modify it. Yeah, the Mac is like a checksum. All a Mac is is a hash value, but what they do is they add a secret key before hashing it. So that even if you know the hashing algorithm, you cannot forge the hash. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. All right, so now let's take a look at a length limit. That's number five here in my demos. Right, so here, I'm not supposed to be able to buy more than a certain number of phones. So if I try to buy one phone, it works. But if I try to buy 11 phones, I'm pressing one, but nothing happens. So why is that? Let's take a look at this. If I examine this, highlight this stuff, and then right click and inspect, I can see the source code. OK. And I wonder if I can make it bigger. Yeah. All right. So let's, here we are. Here's the form that sends that data up. And here you see the input field has max length equals one. So you can only put one character in that field. That's how it prevents me from buying more than nine phones. And that's in the HTML here. But of course, uh, that doesn't matter if I use burp. So if I look at my burp proxy, and go to proxy. Here's the last request. Uh, hidden 5, I think that's it. Yep, hidden. Well, yeah, see, I'm pretty sure this is it. Let's send this to a repeater. Yeah, it's the same old thing. Quantity equals 1. I can just change it here, and now I'm outside the browser, so the length limit of that field in the browser doesn't matter. And now when I send that, I did buy 10 iPhones, so, you know, not much of a surprise, but that kind of length limit does not work. Uh, all right. Now, if sometimes when you refresh a page, you don't really get a fresh copy of the page. Your browser just shows you the stored copy. That's because when you send a request, it might say, um, there's an e tag string in here which identifies it as sort of which version you're seeing. And it might notice that that version hasn't changed and therefore just show you the saved version. And sometimes your browser will send if modified since a certain date or if none match header. There's various headers which say, don't bother sending me the page again if it hasn't changed. And so you can override that using shift refresh will usually force a clean refresh in your browser, or you can use burp and remove those headers. So it will not, it will send us a plain request for the page without saying there are any conditions under which I don't want the page. Yeah, the e tag, yeah. And that, the e tag is in the response, the e tag identifies it. This is the 304 not modified. That's what it tells you. So I guess the e tag must have always also been in the request. And the server is saying, the e tag is still the same, so it's not modified. So I guess it must have been in the request too. I haven't seen this in the ones I've looked at in real life, but it must be used by some browsers. All right, so let's try script based validation. So here I've got a page with a form, and when you click the button to submit it, there is up here in form name is the action. Now here's the PHP script on the server it will run, but you also have this JavaScript on submit return validate form. This is how you do 
client-side validation of things like making sure a zip code has five digits and things like that. So it goes up here in an earlier part of the page and runs validate form. And validate form checks things. It uses the document object model to see what the quantity filled in here is. And if it's bigger than five, it returns false and doesn't um, send it to the server. So this is client-side validation with JavaScript, which is very commonly done. And the problem is you can defeat it a lot of ways. I could just disable JavaScript in my browser. I could modify the script in my browser. Or I could, again, just re uh, replace the value after the script runs. So let's do one of them here. So here's script-based validation. I put in 6 and submit it. And it says quantity too large. You can't, and it doesn't ever send anything to the server. So let's clear out the old stuff in Burp. Proxy, history. Let's clear the old stuff. Clear history. Okay, and let's buy one phone. So the request will actually go to the server and submit. Okay, I got one. And now, Here's the post that did that. I sent it to the repeater. And it wouldn't let me change this number inside the browser, but of course now I can change it and make 14 and send that. Now I'm outside the browser beyond the reach of JavaScript. And now I bought 14 phones. So it's pretty simple. Yeah, yeah, the point, I mean, JavaScript is fine, but you have to understand it's running in the client's browser and they can turn it off or defeat it. So you have to understand the purpose of this client side verification is just to make the page more responsive and to avoid wasting a lot of time on your server with improperly filled out forms. But you can't trust that any of that JavaScript really had the desired effect on the server side. You have to verify it again. So when you're using it, um, all right, if you can use a proxy or a modified source code. So this is how you determine whether validation is also performed on the server if you're doing a pen test. And you can try putting valid data in all fields except one to see what fields will let you change um, things in, will you know, let you break the rules. So the proper use, the point of the client-side validation is to help the user fill out the form. Like if you forget to put in your phone number, you click Submit. This happens to me all the time. And it pops up a box saying, you need to fill in your phone number. It doesn't send anything to the server yet. It helps me fill out the form correctly before bothering to go to the server, which saves everybody time and bother. But it doesn't mean that the server can trust that all that has been done correctly. It's just a convenience for the user to give the user a better experience. And another one is disabled fields. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, here, okay. So this is a disabled field, C449. I can buy a phone, and the price is there, but I can't change it. There is a field, but it's disabled. So if I submit it, I bought a phone for 449, but I would like to buy a phone for 50. So let's see what's going on here. If I highlight that and inspect it, then here we are. Price, input, type, disabled equals true. That's what's going on. The field is there. It's already filled in. And it's disabled is true means it won't let me type into there in the browser. Now, that also means, by the way, if I look at the request here, let me go to my burp and go to proxy, clear out the old stuff. OK, and now if I buy one now, here I am in burp. There's the request. If I send it to the repeater, notice quantity equals 1. It did not even send the price to the server. They're not kidding. Disabled means disabled. That field just sits there, and it doesn't even send this data to the server. The price is determined on the server. So it looks like we can't cheat on the price. But the trick is we you might find that the field is used at the other end, even though it's not normally set up. So you can just add it here anyway. And price equals 9. And now if you send that, it is possible that the code on the server 
will accept that price even though it didn't expect the price to come in. And of course that's true in this case. Now I bought a phone for nine. So it wasn't supposed to send that up, but if I did anyway, it would accept it on the server because it's just written sloppily. Which is of course true of all these vulnerabilities. They're all from sloppy coding. All right. And the last thing is the automatic thing that will undo all this, which is pretty awesome, the automatic way to do all this stuff. If you go to Burp Proxy Options and you go down here to Response Modification, it has a bunch of options to do all this stuff. Unhide hidden form fields, enable disabled form fields, remove length limits, and remove JavaScript form validation. This will automatically change every page to remove all those security features for your convenience. So now, if you just look at this page and refresh this page, now it's added the hidden field here, it's added the hidden field here, it's made this disabled field enabled so I can buy a phone for four. You know, this makes it too easy. Now you can just use the GUI and uh, where's the one with JavaScript script based validation? I'm not supposed to be able to buy too many. I can now just put in 333 and get, you know, it just turns off all those features. So this is the real easy way to defeat all that stuff. That's why everybody loves Burp. Burp makes everything easy. All right. Okay. So let's take a look at some cahoots. And that's here, 5A. All right. Yeah, yeah, that just automatically does the same. Yeah, modifying the GUI using the browser tool. Yeah, you can, do, you can do all this without burp. You can do it in Python. You can do it by just saving the source code and modifying the page. Let me just make sure this thing is set correctly. Show questions and answers. Good, okay. So I can run this in classic mode. Yeah, that's why Burp is the uh, professional tool for web pen testing. It makes it easy to do all these tricks. Got 14. Might be a few more coming. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. Looks like we got everybody. So why do web apps send data to the user and expect the user to send it back? Well, um, no, I don't think it conserves server resources, not particularly. Um, I don't, is this the one you folks thought was true? I don't think that's true at all. Um, 
if it said so in the book that it conserves server resources? We're not screwy to me. This is what I think this is the best answer to simplify coordination across multiple services. If you find it in the book, let me know. Then I should probably modify this question. Uh, that seems uh, highly unlikely to me that it actually uh, could be. If the book says that, let me know. I can't change this Kahoot right now, but I will modify it for future classes if I'm actually contradicting something in the book. But this is the main thing I know. Uh, it's so you just don't have to adjust other servers. Anyway, all right. All right. So what, which is easy for the end user to modify without even using burp? And of course, uh, you're right, ECC, I could make both answers correct. If I, I don't think that other answer is correct, but if someone convinces me, that would be another fix and be accept either answer. And so the URL, of course, you can see it in your browser, you can modify it. All right, what do you have to do to make a compressed response readable in Burp? All right, yeah, stop accepting compressed encoding. All right. All right, how do you completely reload a page? All right, shift refresh is good. All right, that's Judy, I think. TV, I don't know who that is. They have to tell me if they want their points. And JC, oh, perhaps I have Judy and Jordan both here. JC is Judy and Jordan, one of them is Judy and one is Jordan, I think. I'm recording one of them as Jordan and one as Judy. That's my... Okay, good. All right, fair enough. Good. All right. Then uh, I've got them both recorded well enough. The only mystery is TV. All right. The benefits... I don't see conserved resources there. Yeah, okay. TV is Tarash. Good. Good, I can record that then. Good. Good. Then I got names for everybody. All right. So let's see, it's a five minutes to seven. So let's take a 10 minute break and then I'll talk about the rest of this chapter and demonstrate some more from the Web Security Academy. So I'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs>